When Robert I Baratheon died and the War of the Five Kings started, many thought that Stannis Baratheon, Robert's cold, unyielding brother, was the rightful king. But what good are lineages? What good is law? What good is justice when fighting an unwinnable war? As it turns out, real power resides not with the law, but with men, especially when those men command large armies. And men tend to be more easily persuaded by charm, grace and generosity than they are by cold justice, and more willing to fight for those who hold their father's faith rather than those who follow the Red God's cruel priestesses. And so it was the charming Renly Baratheon, who did not have the strongest claim by any law of gods and men, was able to defeat his older brother. Despite his weaker claim, despite his rumored cowardice at the Battle of Crow's Nest, where he supposedly ran away from a duel with his brother after seeing his flaming sword, and despite darker rumors suggesting the use of blood magic by Stannis, Renly Baratheon emerged victorious. In the Stormlands, his generals selected the sites of their battles carefully, always making sure that the superior tactical mind of Stannis could not make use of the mountainous terrain. And once a suitable field of battle was selected, broke through his lines with sheer force of numbers. Renly's ally and father-in-law, Mace Tyrell, the Lord of Highgarden, even laid siege to Stannis' own fortress on the rocky island of Dragonstone. Meanwhile, in the north, Rob Stark of Winterfell fought to free his two sisters and avenge his father. But the bastard Joffrey, the cruel boy king, having already beheaded Rob's father Eddard, now too beheaded his sister and erstwhile betrothed Sansa Stark. Rob would die shortly afterward in personal combat with Red Ralph Stonehouse, the infamous Ironborn warlord. Some say Rob, devastated by the loss of his sister, deliberately went where the fighting was thickest, dying in a mad, impotent rage. After his victory over his brother Stannis and the defection of Stannis' former bannerman, King Renly quickly moved on the capital, King's Landing, to commence with his epic, months-long siege with some 40,000 Tyrell and Baratheon soldiers. The boy king, Joffrey Baratheon, hid somewhere in the city like a coward. In his siege camp, word reached King Renly of the death of Tywin Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock and Renly's most powerful adversary. While rumors of murder plots were ubiquitous, most maesters now agree that Lord Tywin's death was natural. That being said, Despite his explicit wishes to the contrary, Tywin's son Tyrion Lannister was able to gather sufficient support at the royal court and Casterly Rock to be accepted as Tywin's successor regardless of the late lord's will. The imp's skill as a ruler did not compare unfavorably to his father's, despite foul rumors to the contrary. Shortly after the death of Tywin, the Golden Company arrived at the shores of the Crown Lands. At its head, was a young man famously claiming to be Rhaegar Targaryen's son, Aegon, known to posterity as the Mummer's Dragon. While his invasion would be immortalized in plays and songs, his small army was no match for the armies of the Lannister crown, and his impact on the War of the Five Kings was limited to distracting the Lannisters from King Renly's siege. In the north, despite the crown's many distractions, a Northman now led by the crippled boy Brandon Stark, never recovered from the loss of their previous leader, Rob Stark, the young wolf. The Lannisters pushed their armies out to the north of the Neck, and Brandon Stark surrendered to Joffrey the boy king shortly after, not willing to continue this war now that his sisters were dead or missing, and hoping for mercy. Lord Brandon, despite being very young, should have known better. Despite promises to the contrary, Joffrey imprisoned both Lord Brandon and his grandfather, Hosta Tully, Lord of Riverrun. In an act of cruel tyranny made infamous by the bards of the Crown Lands in later years, Joffrey ordered the hanging of the boy and his grandfather. Many of Joffrey's vassals, especially in the north, were disgusted by this dishonorable act and chose to join Renly's side, further swelling 
the young stag's already large army. Joffrey's incompetent cousin, Lancel Lannister, was appointed Lord of Viveron, while the eunuch Varys, Master of Whisperers of the Iron Throne, was appointed as temporary steward of the North. Renly successfully captured King's Landing by the end of the year, and the rest of the war was determined by several major battles between Stag and Lion, mainly in the Crown Lands. The battles of Stokeworth and Pallors, taking place within days from each other, were both major Baratheon victories. The battles of Sow's Horn and God's Eye, within sight of the Isle of Faces, were much closer run affairs, and while a tactical Lannister victory, the Lannister loyalists decided to move to recapture King's Landing rather than press their advantage, thus allowing King Renly's armies precious time to recover and link up with reinforcements from the harbor. While the Lannisters did successfully recapture King's Landing and move the royal family back into the Red Keep, they did not repair its walls nor replenish its, its garrison quickly enough. Renly was able to move back in force, utilizing the wall breaches he himself had created in the previous siege, and through intimate knowledge of the city and its weaknesses, was able to capture the royal family in the Red Keep within hours. With Stannis defeated, Joffrey now in house arrest, Renly Baratheon, called the Beautiful and the Young Stag, could proclaim himself king in the set of Balor. But despite the loss of three kings, the War of the Five Kings was not over yet. King Renly's reign is traditionally dated from this time, the 301st year after Aegon's conquest, and just after Renly's second siege of King's Landing, around three years into the war itself. But his reign would prove far from secure in the early years. Renly's first priority was to deal with his remaining enemies, and while he would do so fairly leniently, the murder of longtime Baratheon ally Ned Stark and his children, Sansa and Brandon, would not go unpunished, and neither could the execution of Hoster Tully, the Lord of Riveran. Joffrey, the bastard boy king, who had personally commanded Stark and Tully executions against the advice of both his regents and his small councillors, was beheaded for his crimes. Lord Tyrion Lannister of the Westerlands was called to trial remotely to answer for his crimes as well, but refused, and in fact called his bannermen to fight the Baratheons, ostensibly to protect his nephew Tommens and his niece Marcella's claims and avenge Joffrey's death. Renly sought to punish the Lannisters, but also, more cynically, to break their hold on the Iron Throne and avoid paying the huge debt the crown owed to the house after Robert's hedonistic lifestyle. Renly soon moved on Castle Rock, starting the second phase of the War of the Five Kings. The first skirmishes of the war took place along the King's Road near Five Head. Renly's army was victorious, prompting several Westerland lords to declare for the King on the Iron Throne, rather than their own King in the Westerlands. The lords of Seaguard and Southstone in the Riverlands also had not surrendered to King Renly, and this distraction bought the Lord of the Westerlands some time while the royal move armies moved north. After Southstone was defeated, its ruler demanded trial by combat to defend her honor. She selected Brynden Tully, the Blackfish, as her champion. While he lost the trial against the mighty Sir Robert Royce, uh, King Renly was impressed with the Blackfish's dueling skill and quick wit, and later decided to grant him the prize he had just lost for its lady by losing the trial, the Lordship of Southstone itself. Once Southstone and Seaguard were defeated, Renly's armies could return to the Westerlands. Now controlling less than half of his father's lands, his brother Jamie and nephew Tommen in custody, and faced with overwhelming numbers, Lord Tyrion surrendered to his new king. After Lord Tyrion of the Westerlands had surrendered, he was given a remarkably fair trial. King Renly, more merciful than the late King Joffrey, decided to send Tyrion to the Wall and seize the Lannisters' ancestral seat of Casterly Rock. Lord Tyrion's brother, Jaime, who according to the rumors had gone mad in King Renly's cell, was released to appease Lannister loyalists, 
and was even allowed to rule over his family's remaining lands in the west, most notably the notorious castle of Castamere. King Renly selected Edric Storm to rule as the new lord of Casterly Rock, a lord paramount of the Westerlands. Edric, a young bastard son of the late King Robert and Elisa Florent, had grown up at Renly's court at Storm's End. His guardian had been Renly's castellan and new hand of the king, Sir Courtney Penrose. The boy had impressed many with his charm, strength and authority. Renly had also discussed the matter with his Westerland allies, who were assured de facto rule as advisors behind the throne during Edric's youth. To honor his new title of Warden of the West, Edric took the house name Shield. The Rivellands and the North would also see the appointment of new loyalist rulers. Brynden Tully, the Blackfish, was appointed as the new Lord of Southstone after the previous Lord's Rebellion. As part of an understanding with the remaining Lannister loyalists, Renly decided not to return Riverrun to the Tullys, keeping Lancel Lannister in charge. However, he did grant the Lord Paramountcy of the Riverlands to Lord Brynden, to rule not from Riverrun, but from his new seat of Southstone. The new arrangement in Riverlands and Westerlands was acceptable to both Tullys and Lannisters, though like any good compromise, neither house was very happy with it. When he had been Rob Stark's fellow pretender, Renly had had many allies in the north. But the new king lost much sympathy when, reluctant to raise his depleted armies once again, he decided not to revoke Winterfell from its steward Varys just yet. Instead, he negotiated with the eunuch, recognizing Varys as regent and guardian for Rickon Stark until the boy would come of age. Lady Laessa Flint of Widow's Watch, Renly's oldest and most trusted ally in the region, was appointed Lady Paramount and Warden of the North, with Varys's tacit approval. The move angered many northern lords, who were not willing to accept a scheming eunuch from Lys as ruler of the Stark's ancestral castle in any capacity. Even if Renly had avoided the dishonor of appointing Varys Lord Paramount, his lack of action in the North would come back to haunt the king. With all seven kingdoms now mostly secured, it was time for Renly's famously extravagant coronation ceremony. The event took place on the first day of the new year, 303 after conquest, and was the defining moment of the generation, just as the great tourney at Harrenhal had been 22 years before. However, while the month-long festivities were going on, in the west another echo of the past could be heard. Balon Greyjoy, King of the Iron Islands, still claimed independence. While Renly would most likely have been magnanimous had it come to negotiations, Balon wished to pay the iron price for his freedom. The king and his vessels had sent out large reefing parties all along the western coast of Westeros, raping and pillaging from all town to the neck. Jaime Lannister, now lord of Castamere, barely escaped with his life as the ironborn stormed and burned his castle, just as Jaime's father Tywin had done to its previous lord, 42 years prior. The cruel irony was not lost on the Westerland lords, and the castle soon acquired a reputation for being cursed, even among those who were not normally superstitious. And so he spoke, and so he spoke, that lord of Castamere. But now the rain, we pour his halls with no one there. To hear, yes, now the rain, we pour his hall, and not a soul to hear. Lord Varys, steward of Winterfell, was very unpopular in the north. When the eunuch's position was confirmed by Southron King Renly, there was an outcry in the north. A rebellious band of Lord's levies hill clansmen and volunteers coalesced around Varys' most vocal opponent, the old but loud and often drunk Morse Umber, castellan of his nephew Great John Umber, Lord of Last Hearth. Coarse, hard and rough-hewn, Morse famously bit off the head of a crow that picked out his eye, earning him the nickname Crow Food. As the opposite of the soft-spoken, deceitful, and subtle Lord Varys, 
when Moore's Crowfoot Umber traveled around the north to gather forces for a rebel army, many wished to follow this strong northerner against the perfumed eunuch in Winterfell. As the festivities around Renly's coronation died down, Moors made his move, declaring himself King in the North and laying siege to Winterfell with a force of over 20,000 strong. However, while Moors enjoyed the popular support of the common folk, most lords stayed loyal to Renly's appointed Lady Paramount, Lyasa Flint. Knowing that Lord Varys was a eunuch and thus would not father a dynasty, they were content to wait out his death rather than fight another rebellion, especially considering that the last rebellion had nearly wiped out all of House Stark. When the Loyalist army approached from the south, commanded by Brynden the Blackfish Tully, Crowfoot Umber was forced to break off the siege of Winterfell. Foolishly splitting up his army, Umber was defeated in two swift battles, at High Point and, more famously, at the Dreadfort, where Moore's Crowfoot Umber 75 years of age, but with a lot of fight left in him, was killed in a duel by the Blackfish, himself a sprightly 60. The duel of the old man was made fun of in many comedy troops in the years after the First Umber Rebellion. The North pacified for the time being, Renly considered that a king who could not protect his people from reaving was no true king, and decided to deal with the Ironborn raiding his west coast once and for all. The second Greyjoy rebellion had been more successful than the first, with Balon Greyjoy having ruled as Iron King for nearly four years, and Balon was not going to go down without playing a final trick. While the armies of Lord Edric Shield laid siege to Balon's capital, Pike, the Iron King sailed the entirety of the Iron Fleet around the continent, famously laying siege to King's Landing itself in a bid to capture King Renly and loot the capital. Like most of Balon Greyjoy's life, the act was bold, brazen, but ultimately foolish. A Tyrell army from the Reach, which had numbered the Ironborn 3 to 1, arrived in the capital and destroyed the Ironborn forces before they could get to their ships. Lord Balon himself did manage to escape, but was captured in a naval battle off the coast of Old Town, and forced to once again bend the knee to a Baratheon. In the north, John Umber, called Great John due to his immense physical size, took advantage of the distraction to avenge his uncle Morse, proclaiming himself Morse's rightful heir as King in the North, and declaring war against Lady Paramount Lyessa Flint, this time supported not just by the small folk, but by the Karstarks of Carhold and the Boltons of the Dreadfort. The Second Umber Rebellion raged, while reports arrived from the Wall that Man's Raiders' wildling army had been melting away and wildling refugees has been, had been spotted at Hardhome with the fear of death in their eyes, trying desperately to move south. It appeared that something else had awoken beyond the wall. Something other than snarks and grumpkins. In the north, the Second Umber Rebellion raged on. The northern houses of Karstark, Bolton and Umber united behind Arnulf Karstark, who according to them and many other northerners had a much better claim to the north and Renly loyalists House Flint. Though bold and crooked with age, the rebels selected the old man as a compromise, not willing to press the claim of either Lord Great John Umber or Lord Rickard Karstark, since that would give one rebel family primacy over the other two. In the south, Renly was happy to let this revolt play itself out. The rebels had already confirmed that they would swear fealty to him if they won. He did take advantage of the long-awaited peace south of the neck to rest his brother on Dragonstone. Stannis had been brooding and plotting there for years, with rumors of resurrection, blood magic and fire sacrifice surrounding the island, and Renly had had enough. When Renly's bannermen arrived, Stannis chose to go with them willingly, encouraged by the Red Woman, Melisandre, who told him that the Lord of Light had a greater part to play for him, greater perhaps than the Iron Throne itself. Renly chose to force Stannis' abdication as Lord of Dragonstone to his daughter Shireen and banished his brother to the Wall. At the Wall, Stannis met Tyrion Lannister, the former Lord of the Westerlands. Following his defeat and banishment by Renly, the imp was a drunken shadow of his former self and would die of alcohol poisoning only a few months after Stannis' arrival. In his years at the Watch, 
Tyrion had catalogued much of the Castle Black library, together with Samuel Tarly, specializing in the old archives about the Long Night, and Stannis and the Imp would spend many hours hunched over the books together. On the Iron Islands, while Balon Greyjoy had been allowed to return to Pike, it wasn't long before he mysteriously fell off a bridge between two of his castles. Theon Greyjoy inherited the Iron Islands from his father, and since he was married to Stannis' daughter and Renly's niece, Shireen Baratheon, Baratheon's involvement in Balon's death was an open secret. Beyond the Wall, Wildling King Man's Raider was fighting a mysterious war against enemies unknown in the realms of man. Outrageous stories about the dead coming back to life were abound among the wildlings and even in the Night's Watch, though later maesters were never able to confirm them. Stannis Baratheon and Melisandre, who had gone into exile with him voluntarily, were often seen ranging far beyond the wall, and it is said they helped bring in many shipments of dragon glass from Stannis' former seat at Dragonstone. South of the Wall, the Second Umber Rebellion had resulted in the brutal mutilation and death of Lyessa Flint, and the installation of the 74-year-old Arnulf Karstark, the Usurper, as Lord Paramount. Later, in the early moons of 307 after Conquest, Arya Stark, who had been missing for eight years and presumed dead, arrived again in Harrenhal after a self-imposed exile in Bravos. After spending a few months at King Renly's court, she went north to marry Lord Paramount Benjen II Karstark, the grandson and successor to Arnulf. The Karstarks were by now Arya's best bet to someday regaining Winterfell, and Benjen II was thrilled to legitimize his shaky claim to the north by marrying Lord Paramount Eddard's daughter. After the Second Umber Rebellion, the kingdoms of the Iron Throne entered a period of peace. The only fighting still going on was between the Stormlands and Dragonstone. The Lords of the Stormlands had refused to recognize Shireen Baratheon's succession to the High Lordship, stating they would not support the daughter of a traitor. Instead, they rallied their banners around Robert Baratheon, Renly's son. It wasn't long until the High Lordship was seized and Lady Shireen bent the knee to the seven-year-old Robert, her cousin. Although any defeat is humiliating, Shireen did not mourn the loss of the High Lordship too much. She was allowed to keep the island itself, and was still Lady Paramount of the Iron Islands, to her marriage with Theon Greyjoy. At court, to the great relief of the realm, King Renly and Lady Marjorie produced several children, though not all from both of them. Renly's sodomy was an open secret by this time, and his close relationship with Loras Tyrell, Knight of Flowers and Captain of the King's Guard, was said to be more than just friendship. Still, after Robert, 299 AC, Renly fathered another child with Marjorie, a daughter, Lyanna, 306 AC. And, against all odds, a bastard son, Herrick Waters, 307 AC, with a red priestess. Marjorie gave birth to a bastard son as well, Luthor Waters, 308 AC, with a minor Richmond Lord, but also to young Stefan Baratheon, 309 AC, Renly's second legitimate son. Renly did not seem overly concerned with Marjorie's adultery, quipping, who could resist such a sweet peach? Maesters debate whether this referred to Marjorie or to Marjorie's handsome suitor. The relationship between the Crown and Highgarden remained strong during these years. Sir Olimar, a low-born man from Maester Tyrell's court, accompanied the king's hunting party to during a royal visit to Highgarden, saving Renly from the attack of a wild boar. Sir Olimar impressed the king with his bravery and knowledge of statesmanship and warfare. He was appointed the guardian to Renly's son and heir, Lord Robert of the Stormlands, and would become master at arms, and later Hand of the King. In the east, Daenerys Targaryen had been making a name for herself. Carving out a kingdom for herself in Slaver's Bay, the Mad King's daughter had made it her life's work to end slavery in Essos. In 309 AC, her crusade had reached the largest city in the world, Volantis where she defeated the Triarchs and enforced emancipation. Her growing strength worried Renly's small council, since Daenerys still called herself the rightful queen of the Iron Throne. But for now, the Dragon Lady's energies seem to be directed elsewhere. But first, she would have to contend with the Iron Fleet. With Renly's tacit approval, and some say his encouragement, 
Theon Greyjoy, Lord Paramount of the Iron Islands, organized a great reaving to Slaver's Bay. Hundreds of ships moved from Pike to Marine and other rich cities, intending to recapture some ironborn glory after the submission of the Iron King Balon. Shortly after the Iron Fleet left Pike, Aegon of Essos, the young man claiming to be Rhaegar's son, landed on the shores of Blackwater Bay once again. But in sharp contrast to his previous invasion during the War of the Five Kings, Aegon now faced a united Iron Throne, with almost all of its lords paramount loyal to the king. Despite commanding nearly double the troops compared to his previous invasion, the young man was still outnumbered nearly five to one. The war lasted less than a year, and this time the Mummer's Dragon did not evade capture and was executed. After the second invasion of the Mummer's Dragon had been defeated, Renly spent some time solidifying his hold over King's Landing's direct neighbors. When the young lady Ermesand of Hayford died without issue, he chose to revert the lordship of Hayford to the crown, defying the custom to grant it to the ladies betrothed. He also broke up the lands of the powerful Lady Felice of Stokeworth, when evidence of her treason was discovered, sending her to spend the rest of her days as a silent sister. In the Riverlands, Lord Paramount Brynden Blackfish Tully stripped Lancel Lannister of all his vassals, though still allowing him to stay Lord of Riverrun for fear of upsetting the crown. In late 311 AC, he put Clement Piper on trial, the son of his vessel Lord Mark Piper of Acorns Ridge. Lord Piper demanded a trial by combat and put himself forward as champion for his son, taunting the Blackfish, who we assumed would send one of his vessels to fight for him. To the surprise of many, Lord Brynden did no such thing, instead choosing to fight Lord Piper personally. But the 68-year-old Lord Paramount, famous for single-handedly ending the First Umber Rebellion by slaying Moore's Crowfoot Umber, had underestimated his vessel, who chopped off the Blackfish's hand before stabbing him in the heart. The Blackfish was succeeded by his six-year-old son, Lord Paramount Robin Tully, who was betrothed to King Renly's daughter, Lyanna Baratheon. Theon Greyjoy's great reaving had been a moderate success. While not able to break the walls of any of the major cities of Slaver's Bay, the Ironborn still managed to loot and burn several cities and castles in Daenerys Targaryen's land, causing the destruction King Renly had hoped for. As reward, Theon was made commander in charge of an army sent to help the Night's Watch repel a wildling invasion beyond the wall. The wildlings were still united under Man's Raider and had been particularly unruly during all of Renly's reign, as well as much better organized. During Mance's invasion, Jon Snow, Ned Stark's bastard son, distinguished himself in battle, and upon the death of Jor Mormont, he was elected as the new Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Jon's early years at the Watch are shrouded in mystery. He accompanied Stannis Baratheon and Melisandre on their long raids, and some say he fought on the wildling side in their mysterious war against an unknown enemy. Sometimes ranging beyond the wall for months at a time, John is said to have kept a wildling mistress by the name of Egret, and to have fathered several bastards with her, despite his oath to father no children. In the Reach it was said that Lord Paramount Mace Tyrell had started to dabble in magic after a conversation with the infamous Archmaester Marwyn the Mage. He had even received a glass candle from Old Town. Afterwards, Mace died of a mysterious disease, and when the Maces performed an autopsy on the late Lord's body, they discovered that his organs seemed to have been burned from the inside, leaving only charred, black remains. What caused this to happen is unknown, but many suggested the involvement of black magic. Lord Mace was succeeded by his 13-year-old grandson, as his eldest son Willis had predeceased him some years ago. As Lord Benjen II Kar Stark, encouraged by his homesick wife Arya Stark, finally made his move on Lord Varys of Winterfell, King Renly organized a great tournament in King's Landing. It was the first major gathering of Renly's vassals since the King's coronation 13 years ago, and many took advantage of the opportunity to petition the King for their various woes. To Renly's credit, he dealt with most of these petitions fairly, though he was quite dismissive of many of the smaller lords' requests and according to tradition asked one of them, which one of the three, my lord, 
cheating wife, bullying, or banditry. Particularly remarkable was the trial of the Queen herself. After the death of her father and older brother, Lady Marjorie had not been seen in public often. She had grown insolent, even violent, and there was talk of madness. Still, Renly's court was shocked when Sir Edric Grafton of Gultown accused the King of murder, and even more shocked when Renly ordered the arrest of his wife, who was pregnant at the time. After some months in house arrest, Lady Marjorie demanded trial by combat, asking her brother Garland Tyrell, known as the Gallant, to be a champion. Renly was surprised, as he would have most likely released his wife had it come to a regular trial, but could not say no to such a public request. Garland the Gallant was pitted against Kingsguard member Sir Archibald Ironwood, the big man, and despite nearly a foot difference in height between the two men, the Tyrell Knight was able to defeat Renly's mountain. Renly, relieved that the gods had judged Marjorie innocent, released his wife the next day. Another famous trial was that of Lady Brienne of Tarth, accused of murdering a Tyrell. Despite Lady Brienne being found guilty by Hand of the King Sir Olimar, the verdict was not uncontroversial, and after a visit to her cell and a hefty sum of gold from the Lord of Tarth, Renly was convinced of Lady Brienne's innocence, granting her a royal pardon. The murder trial of Lord Jamie Lannister, at the behest of Oberyn Martell, also caught many eyes in the capital. Despite having lost a hand, Lord Jamie, mad as he was by this point, demanded trial by combat, but Renly refused. After a regular trial conducted by the Lord Hand, Sir Jamie was found guilty and sentenced to the wall, in the footsteps of his late brother Tyrion. The tourney of King's Landing itself was won by Sir Robar Royce, after an epic joust with the Knight of Flowers, Loris Tyrell, and another one with famous northern warrior Roderick Forrester. Both jousts are remembered in song by the Bards of King's Landing. An almost equally grand tourney was held the following year, hosted by Lord Edric Shield of Casterly Rock. The tourney ended with a duel between the brothers Dennis Plum and Harwin Hearthstone Plum, the latter being declared the winner. While the Southerners were busy fighting the attorneys, Lord Benjamin II Karstark had finally been able to oust Lord Varys from his wife's ancestral home of Winterfell, soon returning it to its lost status as the North's capital. Varys the eunuch was banished to the Wall, where he spent his remaining years writing a famous historical work about the reigns of Kings Robert and Joffrey Baratheon and the War of the Five Kings. This extensive semi-autobiography, called For the Good of the Realm, remains an invaluable source for maesters to this day. The work contains not only Varys' own insider perspective as a member of the small council for both kings, but also many additions by Stannis Baratheon, King Renly's brother, who had been a member of the Night's Watch for 15 years when Varys joined. There is also a remarkable level of detail on Aegon the Mummer's Dragon, and the book is essentially the only reliable source for much of the young man's life. In the East, Daenerys Targaryen continued her crusade against Asosi slavery. The slaves of mighty Volantis had been liberated, but the Queen's war against Myr had ended in a stalemate. Undeterred, the Dragon Queen moved into Lys and Tyrosh. Renly was advised by a small council to start filling his war chest. After all, on a clear day, a man could see Tyrosh from the shores of the Stormlands. Not only that, but the Targaryen pretender had married Tytos Lannister, a noble from House Lannister, the former Lords of the Westerlands who had not only extensive knowledge of Westerosi custom and nobility to aid Daenerys, but also held a personal grudge against King Renly. Man's raider, king beyond the wall for nearly 20 years, once again attacked the Night's Watch in 317 AC. There was a measure of overconfidence and complacency among the brothers. Man's raider had attacked the wall on numerous occasions since the War of the Five Kings, and had always been defeated fairly easily. It came as a shock then, when Lord Commander Jon Snow was captured, and the castles of the Night's Watch overrun by thousands of wildlings. For the first time in hundreds, perhaps thousands of years, the Night's Watch had failed to protect the realms of men, and the North lay open to wildling raiding parties. Lord Paramount Benjamin II Karstark soon assembled an army to deal with the wildling threat. While his Lord Paramount was fighting the wildlings, King Renly left the realm in a regency while he went off to Old Valyria on a reckless treasure hunt. Maesters have debated why Renly would do this. Some say he always wanted to, but waited until his succession was secured. 
Others say he wished to put the supposed Baratheon dragon blood to the test by finding and hatching a dragon egg, or even taming a dragon. Still others say he wished to escape his depressed, wrathful, mad wife, or that he wished to prove something to himself in his middle age. Whatever the case, in mid-318 AC, Renly took off from King's Landing, leaving his hand, Sir Olimar, in charge. When he came back a year later, having had many adventures and stories to tell, as well as a suit of the finest Valyrian armor, he found a realm at war. The unthinkable had happened. Having given up her rule of marine, Daenerys Targaryen, the Mad King's daughter, and the Baratheon's most powerful enemy, had declared war on the Iron Throne. The war against Daenerys Targaryen ended sooner than anyone had expected. As King Renly and his brothers-in-law Garland and Loras Tyrell assembled the largest army Westeros had ever seen in King's Landing, brave Lord Reynald II Westerling seized the initiative. He assembled an army of around 15,000 Westerlander and Stormlander loyalists and sailed to Slaver's Bay in a counter-invasion. The Dragon Queen, who was still at her castle in the no man's land between Yunkai and Marine to coordinate their forces, was taken completely by surprise and did not have her dragons by her side. The castle soon fell and Daenerys was taken to the other side of the world, Lord Reynald's castle of the Crag, in the far north of the Westerlands. The war had ended with a single epic act of bravery and bravado, and King Renly would not forget it. Daenerys was executed unceremoniously, leaving behind two small children, Aenar Targaryen and Diella Fire, the latter a bastard of House Frey. Queen Marjorie's madness had progressed even further, but her ambition and cunning had remained. Lord Paramount Eustace Tyrell, Marjorie's nephew, sat on the throne of High Garden, and Marjorie had assembled a motley crew of crown loyalists, dissatisfied reachmen, and sellsword opportunists to try to oust her nephew from her ancestral seat, taking the reach for herself. Needless to say, this harebrained scheme did not work, and after a short war, Lord Paramount Eustace was able to capture his aunt. Not wishing to upset the crown, he released Marjorie against a symbolic ransom, with the tacit understanding that Renly would not punish him for his inaction in the war. But not before Marjorie had spent several months in the Reach's darkest dungeon, and had even given birth there to a stillborn babe. Two of Daenerys' three dragons were tamed. Pureborn Methiso of Karth used the magic of his city's warlocks to tame Rhaegal, giving the desert city a distinct advantage against his enemies not to mention giving himself an advantage over his fellow pureborn. Drogon, the largest of Daenerys' three dragons, was tamed by a noblewoman by the name of Rhaenys Atroxiaris, who took advantage of her blood, her family being one of the last remaining houses of old Valyria. A quick war against Daenerys was bad news for Lord Edric Shield of the Westerlands. The bastard son of Robert Baratheon, Edric had wished to use a weakened crown to press his claim to the Iron Throne. He had already secured the support of Lord Benjen II Karstark of the North and Lord Doran Martell of Dorne. And after cajoling the weak-willed Lord Robert Arryn of the Vale into his faction as well, he judged that he was strong enough, even without the Targaryen distraction, to declare war on King Renly. He judged poorly. Renly had ensured the support of Lord Robin Tully of the Trident and Lord Theon Greyjoy of the Iron Islands, and despite being outnumbered overall, his army, under Garland Tyrell, was mobilized much quicker than the armies of his enemies. Moving quickly to capture Edric's shield in Casterly Rock, the army instead ran into Edric's army camp in Deep Den. Edric's vessels had not all arrived at the camp yet, but as luck would have it, Edric himself had. In a similarly unexpected stroke of good luck, reminiscent of the war against the nearest Targaryen, uh, Renly's army was able to surround the camp and imprison Lord Edric's shield. Once more, ending an existential threat with a single, bold and decisive act. The aftermath of the Bastards' Rebellion would change the political situation drastically. The Martells of Dorne were punished through the trial of Lady Ariane, the heir to Dorne Martell, who was sent to the Silent Sisters, but the Martells were otherwise allowed to keep their land. Lord Paramount Benjen II Karstark was forced to forfeit the Lord Paramount Sea of the North, which Renly granted to Rickon Stark. Ned Stark's last surviving son. The cruel, wrathful, arbitrary Rickon was not a popular man, 
but he was the rightful heir to the north and had a better claim than Benjamin II had ever had. So most northern lords accepted him, as they had no particular love for the Karstarks in any case. Benjamin II did evade execution by demanding a trial by combat, which he won against all odds. The Westerlands were granted to Lord Reynald of the Crag, the man who had, through his bravery and bravado, ended the war against Daenerys much quicker than anticipated. Renly also wished to revoke the Lord Paramancy of the Vale from Robin Arryn, but this was not accomplished peaceably. Still, the armies of the Vale were no match for the veteran armies of the Crown, and with most of his troops wiped out and the Eyrie under siege, Lord Robin surrendered. King Renly had lost his patience, and rather than show mercy, he pushed Robin through the moon door. The veil was given to Renly's most trusted advisor and hand of the king, Sir Olimar Risley. Rickon Stark was quickly forced to resign as Lord Paramount in favor of Benjamin II Car Stark, who despite his treason had escaped execution through winning his trial by combat. Many in the north were still Car Stark loyalists, and the unpopular Rickon was not particularly interested in moving back to the cold north after so many years in King's Landing. To the surprise of many in the realm, in 8322, King Renly passed away between the legs of his queen after a night of passionate lovemaking. Many throughout his life had thought that Renly was not particularly charmed by the fairer sex, but Queen Marjorie's bedmates later confirmed that there was no foul play. The familiar sounds of royal intimacy had not been particularly different from the usual. The Iron Throne passed to Renly's son, Robert II. Not as well liked as his father, the cruel, stubborn and cynical Robert lacked his father's charm and good looks. But Renly had ruled for 20 years, and so most lords had gotten used to the status quo and didn't immediately plan their revolt. Although many factions formed to oppose cruel King Robert, Robert's diplomats convinced the North and the Vale to remain neutral for the time being, through appealing to honor and to the love they bore Renly, Robert's father. In 8324, during an outbreak of the bloody flux in King's Landing, Lady Rhaenys Atroxiaris, known as Rhaenys the Dragon Rider, arrived in King's Landing on the back of a dragon. It was Drogon, the largest of Daenerys Targaryen's three dragons. Despite scaring the city half to death, Rhaenys arrived alone and without hostile intent. She had trouble controlling the massive beast and requested the use of King's Landing's dilapidated dragon pit. Ambitious and uncaring when it came to the safety of the small folk, King Robert allowed it, sending maesters to study the chained beast to find a way to tame it, should Rhaenys the dragon rider before an unfortunate accident. In 326 AC, four years into Robert II's reign, the wildlings attacked once more. King Beyond the Wall Man's Raider had been ousted by Aragor Skullsmorn. But the wildlings are not like those south of the wall. They have no loyalty towards any crown, and had only followed Mans personally. Mans, after all, had stopped the mysterious invaders from the lands of Always Winter, and had even managed to conquer and hold the wall itself, albeit briefly. Aragor had accomplished nothing like that, and his takeover was therefore not accepted by most. His attack on the wall was a desperate move by King Aragor to strengthen his rule. Instead, it achieved the opposite. The armies of the north once again repelled the attack, and the large wildling army finally fell apart into its constituent tribes again, much to the relief of the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. The first major challenge to Robert II came with the scion of House Durandon, the traditional kings of the Stormlands, before Aegon the Conqueror replaced them with the Baratheons three centuries ago. This Herbert Durandon, lord of a small Stormlander castle, had gathered a significant force in a bid to retake his ancestors' kingdom from the hated Baratheons. Surprisingly, most major lords decided to back their king against his would-be usurper. Even in the Stormlands, only Argilac Musgood, Lord of Drake's Grave, joined the revolt. The revolt in the Stormlands was quickly squashed, and it was here that Robert II's cruelty was revealed for all to see. Not only did he execute Herbert Durandon after cutting off most of his limbs, but he is rumored to have personally strangled Herbert's wife, and most of his immediate family was tortured and killed, some being pitted against bears in an impromptu bear pit, while the king and his court watched and cheered. Infamously, 
he also executed the entire Musgood family, including all the children. For his crimes, the High Septon excommunicated Robert II. But despite Robert's newly gained notoriety, the Cruel Act had not been arbitrary. It was directed specifically at treasonous vassals and revolters, and the message was well received by Robert's vassals, who would now think twice before trying anything treasonous. Robert's reign was further secured by reining in some of his more unruly vessels by tying them to his house by marriage. It seemed that despite everything, the cruel king would be around for a while. In 329 AC, King Robert embarked on a grand tour, leaving the realm in the capable hands of Sir Olimar. Some say he wished to escape the land he hated, others that he wished to escape those who hated him and some say it was pure, blind ambition. Whatever the case, the journey would change the king for life. Somewhere around the Stepstones, on the way from King's Landing to Old Town, the royal ship encountered a terrible storm. A piece of the ship's mast broke off and hit the king in the face and arm. The ship's surgeon was forced to amputate Robert's nose and left arm, maiming him for life. Despite this horrible injury, it's said that, stubborn and cynical as he was, the king refused to stop his epic journey early, threatening the captain with a beheading unless he pressed on. The pain-induced, delirious dreams that followed Robert throughout the rest of his journey would profoundly change the king. It said the stranger visited Robert in these dreams, telling him blatantly that the gods, having saved his life this time, would not give him a second chance. The journey was a turning point in Robert's life. Before the journey, many feared he would be another mad king and would meet a similar ignominious end. But after the journey, the king started to sincerely attempt to change his ways. The journey itself also opened Robert's eyes, as he visited the seven wonders of the world. The royal ship travelled to Old Town, then up to the Wall, back down to Bravos and Volantis, Carth and Old Geese, and even the Soros. Having seen much and more, Robert returned home at the end of 330 AC. When Robert returned from his journey, he found his family plotting and scheming. His wife, Louisa Sand, the youngest bastard daughter of the late Oberyn Martell, had used her husband's absence to gather an army of loyalists to try and take Dorne from her legitimate, but younger, brother, Prince Baduin Martell. For a while it seemed the war would be successful. Louisa's armies were even able to kill Prince Baduin on the battlefield. But Baduin's successor, Angram Martell, was able to defeat Larisa Sand, locking her up in the dungeons of Sunspear. Cruel King Robert did not seem to be particularly bothered by this, even offering to marry his daughter to Prince Angram's son, Kyle. Most of the members of Robert's Kingsguard had served in King Renly's Rainbow Guard 30 years earlier. As they started to reach old age in the early 330s AC, many passed on and needed replacement. In addition, Robert had been looking for a way to oust Lord Commander Loras Tyrell, whom the king had always seen as a rival to his father's affection. The two men didn't trust each other, and when evidence was presented of Loras Tyrell's well-known and long-established sexual preferences, Robert took the opportunity to arrest the Knight of Flowers and call him to trial. Opting for trial by combat, Loras was pitted against the old but fierce ironborn warrior Harris Harlaw. In his youth, Loras might have prevailed, but he was approaching 50 and was slain by Harlaw's mighty axe. Loras was replaced in the King's Guard by Garland Tyrell, his older brother, who sadly died shortly after, and was replaced as Lord Commander by Alice of Gallows Grey, one of late King Renly's closest friends. Sir Geoffrey, a giant man and famous warrior distantly related to House Frey, and Sir Ellery, a just and brave duelist from the Riverlands, later joined as new members. In the Vale, Lord Paramount Olimar Risley, trusted hand to King Robert and to his father before him, was attacked by the ambitious young Lord Paramount Robin Tully of the Riverlands, the son of Brynden Blackfish Tully. He petitioned Lord Robert to order Lord Robin to stand down, which Robert did, but this direct royal order was ignored, and Robin Tully was branded a traitor, imprisoned and sent to the wall. The Riverlands were left to Lyman Tully, Robin's ten-year-old son, and King Robert's nephew. In the Reach, young Lord Paramount Eustace Tyrell, Mace Tyrell's grandson, passed away, 
and was succeeded by his daughter, an infant by the name of Bione. Soon after, she died of asphyxiation, and some blamed Queen Dowager Marjorie, who was second in line to inherit, and would have passed Highgarden to the hands of King Robert Baratheon himself upon her death. But the Queen Dowager's mental health had been deteriorating since her imprisonment in 314 AC, now nearly 20 years ago, and one day Lady Marjorie didn't wake up from her delirious dreams. The last of her harebrained schemes had again been unsuccessful, and her nephew Luther Tyrell survived them to become Lord Paramount of the Reach, even replacing Marjorie as Master of Laws. 333 AC was the year of the grand marriage of Oris Baratheon, heir to the throne, to Jelena Risley, daughter of the Lord Hand, Olimar of the Vale. Prince Oris was known to the realm as an honest man, with a silver tongue and quick to smile, generous with his gold and a brave knight besides. Lady Jelena, though only 14 years of age, was already skilled at court intrigue and an easy liar, but still had a genuinely kind soul. The popular couple did not hide their ambitions on the Iron Throne, much to the dismay of their powerful fathers. The wedding ceremony was accompanied by a grand tourney, the first in nearly 20 years. As was tradition, King Robert held court and oversaw many a minor dispute between lords, with a lot less cruelty than his dealings with the Musgoods several years ago. Robert also appointed his son Oris Lord Paramount of the Stormlands, as he himself had been prior to his coronation, and gave him a place on his small council as Marshal. The tourney saw a good performance by Seleucerus Velaryon, whom many saw as one of the best swordsmen in Westeros. He managed to unhorse Kingsguard member Sir Rory Falcon, but in the end was beaten by a certain Sir Raymond, an unknown knight from the Riverlands. After managing to unhorse Sir Ellery in the final tilt, Sir Raymond gained much acclaim by his victory, even being tapped as a potential new member of Robert's Kingsguard. The court of Robert II in the mid-330s AC was a lively place. The young boy Oberyn Baratheon was already immensely tall for his age, and was placed in the care of tourney victor Sir Raymond, who would tutor him in the art of sword fighting. The Oberyn preferred his great uncle's giant warhammer. Rhaenys Atroxieris, the dragon rider, had become an oft-seen guest in the Red Keep, and King Robert and his children sometimes accompanied her to the dragon pit to watch her train her ever-growing dragon, Drogon. It is said she even took the children with her on some of her flights. Robert, realizing the immense potential of having a dragon rider ally, appointed Rhaenys as one of his commanders. As a gesture of good faith, Prince Angram of Dorne finally released Robert's wife Loriza from house arrest in the Water Gardens in 335 AC. Robert hadn't realized how much he had missed her until she returned and it's said that after Larissa's return, the middle-aged couple found a love for each other that had not been there before. The peaceful interim ended when evidence was discovered that Luthor II Tyrell, Lord of the Reach, had been viciously slandering King Robert. Robert, still holding a grudge against Luthor after his mother's failed scheme to inherit Highgarden, took this opportunity to order the arrest of the Lord Paramount. Lord Luthor refused to submit and raised his levies to revolt. He had expected much of the realm to rally behind him, since cruel Robert was still highly unpopular. But Robert's marriage policies had paid off. While only the Stormlands and Dorne joined the crown outright, the other lords paramount stayed neutral. They had all married into the Baratheon family. King Robert donned his Valyrian steel armor and personally led his armies into the Reach. As it turned out, war was what he was born to do. Many recognized his great skill at command, and his bravery in combat on the many battlefields of the Reach and the Crownlands, and especially at the Battle of Bitterbridge in summer 336. But Rhaenys the Dragon Rider turned the most heads. She and her huge dragon accompanied Robert's army to Highgarden, where Drogon proceeded to burn a breach into its walls, allowing the royal army to capture the castle within days. The war was won in early 337 AC. In a controversial act of tyranny, King Robert decided to execute Luther Tyrell, who was his direct cousin, and seize all Tyrell lands. His act of kinslaying lost him much of the goodwill he had built up. However, it did allow him to grant Highgarden and the Reach to his second son, Edric Baratheon. 
His appointment was accepted by most reachmen. Not only did Edric have a strong claim on Highgarden to his mother, the young man was known to be charismatic, just, merciful, and a hard worker. Once the Reach had been defeated, the royal armies turned northwards to attack the Lannisters of Riverrun, who had joined the rebellion. They were quickly defeated, and the Tullys, who had ruled the Riverlands from the castle of Southstone, were returned to their ancestral seat after nearly 40 years. With the deaths of Sir Olimar Risley, the Old Hand, and Sir Robar Royce, the Rainbow Knight, it was clear that the new era was dawning in Westeros, one dominated by a generation who had not lived through the War of the Five Kings. In 338 AC, shortly after the Tyrell Rebellion, Rhaenys Atraxiares, known as Rhaenys the Dragon Rider, died at age 63. She left the dragon Drogon in chains in King's Landing's Dragon Pit, but without a rider, the beast became wild and furious, occasionally even burning alive those robotic goats and other animals to feed on. King Robert II had done his best to prepare for this eventuality. His maesters had studied the beast for years, and Robert had approached and touched it many times. Some say Rhaenys the Dragon Rider had even taken the king with her on her flights. But still, Robert trembled when he approached the chained dragon. Initially, the taming appeared to be going well. Drogon recognized Robert from their many previous encounters and allowed the king to approach and even touch him. But when Robert tried to climb on its scaly back, the beast's eyes widened and the dragon violently shook him off, throwing King Robert against a wall before engulfing him in red-hot dragon flame. Drogon remained wild and enraged for days, and recovering the king's charred remains cost the lives of three dragon minders. Robert II, the third Baratheon king, died at 38 years old. Young and ambitious Prince Oris succeeded his father. The new king spent some time arranging a funeral for Robert and appointing a small council, but otherwise wasted little time in traveling back to the dragon pit. Many thought it brave, more thought it foolish, and the realm held its breath. But Oris did return. He arrived at his father's grand funeral feast with his face half burned, regaling his guests with tall tales and vowing to return when the time was right. After a few years of reaffirming family alliances and helping to prevent uprisings in the Reach and the Westerlands, King Oris was ready for a second attempt at taming Drogon. For years, the king had helped feed the dragon with live animals, each time attempting to get a little bit closer, and often leaving with burn marks. Drogon had gotten used to Oris's face and smell, and even seemed impressed by his bravery. Then, in the spring of 341 AC, the unthinkable happened. During a regular feeding, Oris brought in the old Targaryen dragon saddle, and against all odds, the beast let him strap the saddle on its back. Sweating with unusual fear, and feeling the glow of his old burn wounds, Oris slowly climbed on. Still Drogon did not attack him, nor did he fly away, though he seemed eager to. Instead, he knelt before Norris, allowing the king to climb on the saddle and strap himself in, before flapping his wings and flying upwards above King's Landing. A new Dragon King was born. While King Oris got used to his new dragon, there was unrest in the Westerlands and Dorne. Lady Janae Lannister was the daughter of Lancel Lannister, former Lord of Riverrun before it was returned to the Tullys by King Robert II. She had tried to retake her family's ancestral castle of Casterly Rock, but had been imprisoned and banished to Essos. However, while there, she had taken inspiration from Daenerys and Aegon Targaryen, and had gathered a significant force of cell swords and exiled Lannister loyalists along the shores of the River Rhoyne. Her protracted invasion started in 341 AC, though it would take years before any Lannister soldiers had foot in Lannisport. In Dorne, the powerful house Ironwood revolted against Prince Angron, ostensibly to place the prince's younger sister, the Sella Martell, on the throne in Sunspear. The Ironwood Revolt, as it came to be called, pitted half of Prince Angram's vessels against the other half. It took nearly five years of pointless bloodshed before the status quo ante was restored. While war raged in the periphery, King Oris participated in a Crownlander tourney. He impressed with his skill and bravery, even managing to hold his own against legendary tourney knight Sir Raymond for two tilts before losing. It was at this journey that King Oris took on a young peasant boy by the name of Glendon, who would go on to become the king's squire and ward. 
the Crown's financial situation was improving as well, and Horace finally felt that the time was right for a grand coronation ceremony, which happened in 343 AC, five years after King Robert's death. Shortly after his coronation, Horace decided to put his newly acquired dragon to good use. Pirates from the Stepstones had been harassing merchants for years, but their ships had always been too fast and their hideouts too well hidden for the Royal Navy to catch them. But no ship can outsail a dragon, and even secluded bays are still visible from the sky. Some burnt flagships and intimidating dragon visits later, the pity pirate kings surrendered without a fight. As reward, the strongest among them was made Lord Paramount of the Stepstones, and tasked with protecting trade, though the Royal Navy needed to stick around to escort the pirate ships for many years before the pirate king could be trusted alone with his task. Beyond the wall, a new king had arisen. King Gerd Pikehead, son of the others, had united the tribes once more, and Horus accompanied a small force to the far north to help the Night's Watch protect the realms of men. The wildlings had laid siege to Castle Black itself, and would have taken it if not for the timely intervention of King Horus. Dragon fought giant and mammoth, and the wildlings were soon driven back, though they would almost certainly return. Around 60 years ago, Aerys Targaryen, the fire-obsessed Mad King, had ordered the production of a huge wildfire stockpile, which he planned to use to destroy King's Landing before being stopped by Jaime Lannister. King Renly had disposed of about half of the dangerous liquid early in his reign, but the disposal process was costly and dangerous, and the remainder had been left to gather dust under Robert II and Horus. In 345 AC, the Day of Reckoning arrived for this short-sighted policy. Whether by accident or on purpose, the entire stock of wildfire was ignited, and King's Landing and its surroundings were caught in a months-long firestorm that killed thousands and destroyed much of the city. The Great Wildfire of 345 AC would be a landmark moment in the history of the Baratheon dynasty. For King Renly's daughter, Sylvaina, it would be a landmark moment in another way. While she was watching the green firestorm from her window in the Red Keep, the dragon egg she slept with started to crack. A new dragon was thus born, and Sylvaina named him Orion. So too, perhaps, did the wildfire spark the queen's womb. While it was raging, Queen Jelena discovered she was pregnant. The child would be a healthy boy, Robert, called Fireborn. When normal court life resumed, a merchant arrived at King Oris' court, accusing Lord Paramount Giles Risley, son of Olimer, of raping his daughter. Having been summoned to King's Landing, Lord Giles demanded not just a trial by combat, but a trial of the Seven. Seven men, including Lord Giles himself and his friend Lord Paramount Lyman Tully of the Riverlands, were pitted against King Oris' King's Guard. However, these men were no match for the King's Guard. Sir Geoffrey of the Crossing proved his reputation as the best swordsman in Westeros by personally defeating four of Lord Giles the Seven. Since he had lost the trial, King Oris sent Lord Giles Risley to the wall. Giles' infant son would die in a very peculiar accident, and so the veil was inherited by Jelena Risley, Lord Giles' sister, who happened to be married to King Oris himself. Though he hadn't planned it, the trial had proven very advantageous to the king. Once the fire had fully subsided, it was time for King Oris to use his strengthened position. Having secured the Stepstones earlier in his reign, a logical first step would be to conquer the three daughters, Tywash, Myr, and Lys. Had the cities been united as they once were, they might have posed a threat together, but the Twyarchy was long dead. Tywash, Lys, and Myr had no love left for each other after two centuries of intermittent warfare over the disputed lands. Thus, rightfully, not expecting any help from each other, and knowing that they could never hope to withstand the full strength of the Iron Throne individually, especially considering Drogon, the largest dragon in the world, the cities surrendered, one by one, without much of a resistance. In Yunkai, events had conspired to form a genuine threat to the new Baratheon dragon riders. The crown of Westeros now held two dragons. King Oris held Drogon, the largest and most powerful dragon of them all, and Princess Sylvaina held the young Orion, who was little more than a court curiosity at this stage. 
By contrast, Yunkai controlled three adult and dangerous dragons. Viserion, another of Daenerys' original three dragons, rivaled Drogon in size and strength, and was written by Triarch Valerion Daumiris himself, leader of Yunkai. Then there was Goldskill, written by Rera Daumiris, a former acolyte of Rhaenys the Dragon Rider. Most importantly, there was Telexis, written by Aenar Targaryen himself. King Oris, brave and ambitious, decided to attack the Yunkish in a risky, preemptive strike. Oris was confident that the mighty Drogon could still defeat young Goldscale and Telexis while they were not fully grown. Viserion would be risky, but the king hoped to be able to distract the Triarch Valerion to get him to fight Drogon one-on-one -on -one without the help of the other two Yunkish dragons. But as the Westerosi fleet moved into Slaver's Bay, word reached Oris that Triarch Valerion had died and that Viserion now ran wild, lacking a dragon rider to aid Yunkai. While this was good news, Drogon was still outnumbered 2 to 1, so the king kept his resolve. An epic spectacle ensued above the skies of Yunkai, once Oris' army had gone ashore. Mighty Drogon, with his rider King Oris Baratheon, fought Goldscale and Telexis at the same time, in a fight the likes of which had not been seen since the Dance of Dragons 200 years ago. Although the battle was hard fought, and King Oris was nearly thrown off or burned on several occasions, Drogon managed to bite through Goldskill's neck, causing Dragon and Rider to tumble to the ground. The Baratheon Dragon proceeded to kill Telexis' rider, Aenar Targaryen, with Dragon Flame, burning Daenerys Targaryen's son, in a sense, Drogon's half brother. Telexis was distracted by the loss of his rider and fell into the sea after several slashes of Drogon's claws, never to resurface. Oris Baratheon had managed to slay three rivals at once. After his dragon duel, Oris and Drogon flew up to the top of the Golden Pyramid of Kagas. Here they met with the leaders of Yunkai and gave them a choice. Surrender now, keep your position and keep your city intact, or surrender only once the city falls to the tens of thousands of Westerosi troops, lose your position and see your city sacked. Wisely, the Triarchs decided to surrender. As promised, King Horus was magnanimous in victory. The Triarchs were not replaced, and other than a mutual defensive pact and a nominal tribute, not too much would change for Yunkai. Horus' leniency may have been a mistake. Within months, Triarch Vario Kyrineon had gone into the hills to tame the wild dragon Viserion. In 351 AC, King Horus, now known as the Dragon Lord, moved his court to Dragonstone. He had always liked the castle, for its defensibility, and he knew the dragons preferred the Dragonmont over being chained up in King's Landing's Dragon Pit. The capital would not lose its importance, however, and the king would make the trip between Dragonstone and the Red Keep on Dragonback a dozen times a year. Later that year, a revolt would break out in Lys, which would take some time to suppress, and there would be an outbreak of winter fever in Dragonstone and elsewhere. After this, there was a brief attack on the wall by a new wildling king, known as Small Mammoth, who would fall as quickly as he rose. The three cities could breathe a sigh of relief, as these events, while minor in the grand scheme of things, would delay King Oris's dragon conquests for a few years. The legendary swordsman and Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Sir Geoffrey of the Crossing, died in 355 AC, as had Sir Ellery some years earlier. Sir Imri Catdolphin, the new Lord Commander of the King's Guard would oversee an influx of new members, including from great houses such as Lannister, though it would be a while before any of the new members would live up to the fame of Sir Geoffrey or Sir Raymond the Tourney Knight. King Oris the Dragon Lord continued his life's work of understanding the taming and breeding of dragons by going on a tour to visit various places that were associated with dragon lore. He visited Old Town, Winterfell and Harrenhal, and even went to Essos to visit Volantis and Old Geese. But the most influential of his destinations turned out to be Summer Hall. The burnt out ruin of the once beautiful Targaryen castle prompted Oris to empty the realm's coffers. Filled to the brim after several years of relative peace, to try and restore the palace to its former glory. The restoration effort started in 357 AC, though it would take years before Summer Hall was fully rebuilt. King Oris's wars of conquest resumed in 358 AC. 
After a subjugation of the three daughters, Lise, Myrrh and Tyrosh, and his dragon dance above Yunkai, it was now time to conquer the largest city in the world, Volantis. The dominions of the city had lost their cohesion in recent years, but they could still count on the support of a grand coalition of Bravos, Kohor and Pentos, who all joined in a desperate effort to stop the Dragon Lord before they themselves would be next. King Oris knew he had to take the initiative to prevent the war from escalating further. Landing his token force near Mur, he quickly moved on the fortress of Ulfis Mel. The army rapidly swelled as Oris's vessels joined their king at the siege camp. As the siege in far off Essos continued, the opposing coalition made a bold move of their own. Controlling Blackwater Bay with their combined fleet, the three free cities decided to lay siege to Dragonstone itself in a bid to capture Orestes' family and force him to the negotiating table. As troops started to arrive on the island of Driftmark from King's Landing, in preparation for the relief of Dragonstone, the coalition sent a force to repel them. The Battle of Driftmark was a messy affair. The King's forces had not fully regrouped after their landing, when the coalition forces arrived on the beach in their rowboats. The King's brother, Simon Baratheon, played a major role in quickly rallying the Crown's forces and the coalition army was driven back into the sea on Driftmark's beaches. This had bought Simon's troops valuable time, though his force was still not strong enough to relieve Dragonstone. After taking the Volantine fortress of Ovis Mel, King Horus received word of the siege of Dragonstone, and quickly gathered his forces to link up with those of his brother Simon on Driftmark. The combined army was still significantly outnumbered by the enemy, not to mention, it had the further disadvantage of attacking an entrenched enemy from the water. But Oris did have one advantage over the enemy, his dragon, Drogon. The three lords of Kohor, Pentos and Bravos had all tried to prepare for this eventuality, and they all tried, and failed, to slay Drogon. The Magister Tenisio of Kohor even died in the process. Sir Glendon, Oris' squire and ward, proved himself in battle, defeating Sea Lord Genisio of Bravos and bringing him before his king as a prisoner. The relief of Dragonstone was a generation-defining battle, the likes of which had not been seen since the Battle of the Trident 75 years ago. The coalition was forced to surrender, leaving Volantis to the Iron Throne. Prince Robert, Oris's oldest son and heir, had been imprisoned in Dragonstone throughout the entire siege, but he had not been sitting still. The boy had shown himself to be exceedingly brave in these dire circumstances and had developed into a skilled swordsman besides. He had also managed to hatch a dragon, Lys, to accompany Ariax, the dragon of his betrothed, Lady Simela Targaryen. To celebrate his victory and to spend some of the royal ransom paid by the Sea Lord of Bravos, King Oris organized a grand tourney in Dragonstone, introducing his new court to his vassals. The youngest member of the King's Guard, Sir Randall Hunt, only 16 years of age, performed well in this tourney and there were those who called him a new Lord Tyrell. The tourney was otherwise a way for King Oris to hear the many, many grievances of his vassals and speak justice, although the king was soft on his wife, Jelena Risley of the Vale, despite many accusations of cruelty and murder towards her. King Oris spent a year or two gathering gold and celebrating the marriage of his son and heir Robert to Simela Targaryen. But it wasn't long until the Iron Throne was back at war again. Having a mind for military strategy, Oris realized that he should attack his enemies while they were still regrouping from the previous wars, and so he declared war on his enemies, Pentos and Bravos, in 360 AC. Tero de Han, Magister of Pentos, had nearly died to King Oris' dragon during the relief of Dragonstone, and, scarred by the experience, bent the knee voluntarily. Bravos, however, did not surrender. Sea Lord Genicio Prestain felt safe on his islands, even attempting a second siege of Dragonstone. But without the help of Pentos or Kohor, Bravos on its own could not hope to withstand the forces of the Iron Throne. King Oris flew underneath the Titan's legs, burning down the Sea Lord's palace after capturing most of the Sea Lord's family. With the army of the Iron Throne now occupying Bravos, and with his family held captive in the Red Keep, Sea Lord Genicio submitted to King Oris as well. The Iron Throne now controlled nearly the entirety of the Narrow Sea. There was no shore that did not swear fealty to King Oris, 
who had taken to calling the mass of water Our Sea. No shore except one island in the Stepstones. The conquest of this tiny island from its Summer Islander occupiers would have been the cap on King Oris's career. But the Dragon Lord died at age 45 from a sudden heart attack. An ironic end for a king with endless ambition to die only months before achieving everything he ever wanted. The reign of King Robert III, Fireborn, was short and uneventful. The only notable actions of the king were his attempts at taming the dragon Drogon, after having lost his own dragon earlier in his life. Thrice King Robert attempted to tame Drogon. He was burned, wounded and finally killed, less than two years into his reign. Drogon remained wild on the island of Dragonstone for years after the young king's death. Would King Oris the Dragon Rider remain the only Baratheon Dragon Rider King? The early regency of King Stannis the Unlikely, Robert Fireborn's youngest brother, was led by his uncle, Lord Edric Baratheon. Lord Edric had been Lord Paramount of the Reach for 30 years and was by all accounts considered a just and fair ruler, with a lot of experience. As one of his first actions, the Lord Regent moved the court back to the Red Keep, vastly preferable to cold Dragonstone for someone who was used to the luxuries of Highgarden, not the least of which was its harbour gold. In 366 AC, King Stannis' mother, Queen Dowager Jelena Risley, was released from the dungeons of one of her vessels. The scheming, cynical, cruel woman wasted no time in ruthlessly acquiring a position of confidence in the court of her only surviving son. Perhaps it was Lady Jelena's scheming and conniving, which led to the Crownland Revolt of 366 AC. Lady Tassine Massey of Massey's Hook led a coalition of major Crownlander lords in an ill-conceived revolt against King Stannis, perhaps seeing this rare dragonless period as an opportunity to get rid of the conquering dynasty while they could. Needless to say, the revolt proved unsuccessful, but it did cause major chaos in King's Landing's direct backyard and the rebels yet again laid siege to Dragonstone. The most immediate effect of the revolt was the departure of Lord Regent Edric Baratheon back to Highgarden to raise his troops. This allowed the Queen Dowager Lady Jelena to assume the position of Regent to her son. The ruthless Queen Dowager did not show any of the rebels mercy. None of the rebelling lords were given the option to take the black. Instead, all seven were beheaded in a move not seen since the brutal suppression of the Durandan revolt by the king's grandfather, Robert II, in the late 320s AC. The result was much the same. While the handling of the Crownland revolt was generally seen as a cruel act, it did much to secure the boy king's rule. The small folk of the capital still remember the act when they sing the song Seven Kings, Seven Swings. In the latter stages of the revolt, word reached the court that a minor noblewoman from Dragonstone, called Valina, had tamed Drogon at the Dragon Mount. Similar to Rhaenys the Dragon Rider many years ago, Valina requested the use of King's Landing's Dragon Pit in exchange for her fealty, at least for the time being. King Stannis' small council agreed with her proposal. Valina was 50 years old and would most likely not pose a threat to Baratheon rule anymore. And having Drogon chained up in the Dragon Pit would be beneficial if Stannis ever wanted to tame the beast. In the Vale, the Lady Paramount, Simela Targaryen, passed away. As she was the last dragon, the line of Aegon the Conqueror had now officially been extinguished. The Vale was inherited by Simela's uncle, Tytos Lannister, who was a child from a previous marriage of his namesake, Tytos, the nearest Targaryen's husband. The Lannisters had managed to marry their way back into power. Young King Stannis grew up under the tutelage of many a great fighter, but never managed to become a formidable duelist himself. The boy was not a natural warrior, preferring instead the company of girls. Stannis enjoyed a string of teenage romances, which culminated with his cousin and future wife, Amiana Baratheon. Growing up under the regency of his cruel mother, Queen Dowager Jelena Risley, Stannis became a rather vicious, unpredictable teenager though still devoted to his gods, particularly the Stranger. In 372 AC, King Stannis came of age and started to rule in his own right. To the dismay of the realm, he took after his mother in a major way. 
he loved to enforce his own cruel branch of arbitrary justice, often enacting cruel and unusual punishments. Despite the king's character, his grand coronation feast and accompanying tourney was legendary and had not been seen since the early days of King Oris, more than 30 years ago. The feast happened while Essos burned. The Great Sickness had claimed millions of lives on the eastern continent. The Great Epidemic did not stop King Stannis from making the now customary tour to various locations related to dragon lore. Dragonstone, Old Town, Harrenhal, Volantis and Old Geese were honored with a royal visit. And the effort paid off. By mid-373 AC, King Stannis' dragon egg hatched. The ugly dragon, Oris, was born. Oris was a child of Ariax, the lost dragon of Robert Fireborn's youth, who in turn was a child to Telexis, the dragon slain above the skies of Yunkai in 358 AC. Telexis, in turn, was a child of mighty Drogon himself, who was still housed in the dragon pit, unable to be tamed by any Baratheon. Following in the footsteps of his late uncle, Oberyn Baratheon, Stannis decided to extend his mother's regency a bit longer by giving in to his arbitrary whims. In 375 AC, the pious but cruel king embarked on a tour around the world to explore the mystery of the oily black stone. The king traveled further than any Baratheon before him, even visiting dangerous and mysterious places such as Yin on Sartorios and the shadow city of Ashai. But perhaps in his hubris, the king had flown too close to the sun. It is said that when the royal party landed on the shores of one of the thousand islands in the far northeast, it was captured by the green-tinted islanders. They proceeded to drag every man to an altar of oily black stone, and one by one slit the throats of each member of the royal entourage, bathing the altar in Westerosi blood. King Stannis himself did not escape this fate, and it is said that the island thereafter experienced a hundred years of prosperity and plenty. After all, there is power in king's blood. King Stannis, the second Baratheon king in a decade, who died at age 19, was succeeded by his nephew through his oldest sister, Sylvaina. Lord Paramount Clement Baratheon of the Stormlands quickly established a rapport with Stannis' dragon, Oris who had returned with the surviving crew in 376 AC. But the realm would not submit quietly to yet another incompetent young king. A great ironborn uprising arose months after King Stannis' death, and tens of thousands of devout followers of the drowned god laid siege to Pike. Luckily for the new king Clement, not everyone in the Iron Throne was against him. Most of his lords paramount rallied behind the young king, and most importantly, his mother, Sylvaina, and his courtier, Falina, both formidable dragon riders, joined the fray. Their cooperation doomed the Ironborn Rebellion, which was crushed around a year later. A second rebellion popped up two years later on the other side of the realm, in Slaver's Bay. Yet again, the dragons proved a decisive advantage, and Marine was cowed into submission for the time being. In 381 AC, a diplomatic mission arrived at King Clement's court. Diplomats from the free cities of Lys, Mur, Pentos and Volantis, shockingly also accompanied by a representative of Lord Paramount Edric Baratheon of the Reach, presented the king with an ultimatum. They desired independence and threatened war if their demands were not met. The king lost his temper, cursing at the associate lords, telling them to get out of his sight and never show their faces again. When the delegation, having interpreted this as an agreement to their demands for independence, turned to walk out of the throne room, Clement's guards let everyone pass but the representative of Lord Edric. Clement was content to let these associate lords go their own way, but the Reach was a vital part of the Seven Kingdoms, and Edric was told to submit or fight. The Lord of the Reach chose to fight. Although the Reach was massively outnumbered, the war was long and bloody, and was followed by a long period of subjugating a dozen minor lords who refused to surrender even after Highgarden had been captured. Lord Edric died of causes unrelated to the war and was succeeded by his grandson, Damon Fossaway. The succession was not uncontroversial and many tried to press their own claim on the reach, including Tullys, Kynes and Florence, extending the devastating war in that region. 
The most notable of these claimants was Lady Lyria Selby, who married the king's brother and received his tacit support to press her claim, but was not able to establish a proper beachhead with her armies and failed at the rebellion. After the Reach unrest had more or less died down, the next decade of Baratheon rule is remembered as a period of peace in Westeros. Maesters now agree that this is not quite accurate. There was still a wildling attack on the wall, revolts in the Westerlands and Reach, not to mention serious problems with coastal raiding in the Iron Throne's remaining territories in Essos. Still, the majority of the peasantry under King Clement's rule did indeed enjoy a period of relative peace, not seen since the reign of good King Renly, and they remember this decade fondly. The late 390s continued the period now known as King Clement's Peace, although again the term is relative. Unrest continued in the Reach, and there was a minor revolt in Rosby, which resulted in the lordship being handed over to King Clement's son and heir, Prince Renly. The Wildlings also attacked again in 398 AC. King Clement also took a more proactive role in fighting against the Asosi slave raids, sending his mother, Queen Dowager Sylvaina, to deal with a major band of raiders in Tywash, chasing them to their well-fortified island east of Valyria. She would be away from King's Landing for years, traveling to the Wall to retake Castle Black from the Wildlings, after relieving Tywash from its raiders. In early 399 AC, Clement's dragon Oris laid an egg, which was soon warm to the touch, indicating its desire to hatch. For this reason, the king gifted the egg to his son, Prince Renly, Lord of Rosby. At Rosby, a new dragon was born, the nimble Dressix, which did much to cement Prince Renly's claim as the true Baratheon heir. Oris had also grown up sufficiently to prove valuable to the realm. King Clement had used his dragon to intimidate bravos in the north into obedience. But dragons are a blessing and a curse. Two Baratheon kings had died to dragon fire at a very young age, and by 401 AC, a prince was added to that infamous list. While trying to tame his baby dragon, Tresix, Prince Renly failed to dodge the flames and trotted around blindly while his curtains, bed, and anything else flammable caught fire. The fire spread through his room so rapidly that the young prince could not find the exit in time and was burned alive. And thus ended the first 120 years of Baratheon rule of the Seven Kingdoms. Many thought that it would end with King Robert I, the gluttonous and lustful but brave and handsome first king, who first deposed the Targaryens in 283 AC and whose death kicked off the War of the Five Kings. But they had not reckoned with his younger brother, the charming political animal Renly I Baratheon, who won the War of the Five Kings and defeated all of his opposition over the next decades, including several Targaryen invasions. Renly's son and successor, Robert II, was a ruthless, cruel man, but perhaps that was what the realm needed. Robert certainly succeeded in cowing his enemies and replacing many lords paramount with loyalists if they dared to revolt. When Drogon arrived in King's Landing's dragon pit, Robert tried his utmost to tame the beast, but was burned by dragon flames at age 38. His successor did manage to tame Drogon, and was perhaps the greatest of all the Baratheons, King Oris, now known as the Dragon Lord. Charismatic and generous, but ruthlessly ambitious, his glorious conquests of most of the lands of old Valyria will not soon be forgotten, nor will his epic battle above the skies of Yunkai where two dragons fought his one, and the last Targaryen died. Essos could breathe a sigh of relief, however, since mighty King Oris died at age 45 from a sudden heart attack. The short and uneventful reign of Robert Fireborn, so called because he was born during the infamous Great Wildfire of 345 AC, was ended when the 19-year-old king tried to tame Drogon as his father had done. He died in a fiery blaze. The decade following his death was dominated by Queen Dowager Jelena Risley, who ruled as a regent for her son Senis the Unlikely, the youngest of King Oris's four sons. Her cruel and arbitrary justice made her very unpopular with high lords and small folk alike, and she is best remembered by the song Seven Kings, Seven Swings, which is about the brutal aftermath of the Crownlander revolt. Senis himself would famously die by blood sacrifice half a world away on his journey to the ends of Essos. 
His nephew, through Princess Sylvina, King Oros' favorite daughter, was King Clement Baratheon, known by the small folk as Good King Clement. This was not because of any character trait, the king was wrathful, rude and cruel besides, but rather because of the king's lack of ambition. There were no major wars during King Clement's reign, and it is mostly noted for his decision to allow most of King Oros' conquests, the free cities of Essos, to find their own path. Outside of the Reach, which experienced decades of intermittent unrest, the realm was nevertheless at peace. The kingdom's coffers were full, and the small folk content. The mighty House Baratheon would surely reign for many centuries to come.